the subject of today's um, talk is intriguingly um, called uh, Do Climate Change Refugees uh, Exist? and will be presented by Professor Jane McAdam. Uh, Jane is uh, Director of Research in the school. Uh, she's written a number of books on the subject of uh, refugee law and is recognised as an international expert in the field. Um, her recent research has focused a little more on climate change and its uh, many impacts on various aspects of uh, international law. So without further ado, I'll hand over to, uh, to Jane to commence the lecture. Uh, the, the lecture will last for 40 minutes, and uh, we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes afterwards for questions. So um, questions are welcome. So over to Jane. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brendan, for that introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be here presenting as part of the uh, professorial lecture series for the 40th anniversary of this law school. Well, the title of this lecture, as Brendan said, is Do Climate Change Refugees Exist? It's a loaded question. It's deliberately provocative. From a legal perspective, there is no such thing as a climate change refugee. Yet we know that many people have already moved on account of the impacts of climate change on their environment and livelihoods. And it's likely that this trend will continue in the future. In the past 30 years, the number of extreme weather events has tripled and this trend is predicted to continue. The United Nations Emergency Relief Coordinator has suggested that more frequent and more severe disasters may be the new normal. On top of this, slower onset impacts of climate change, such as temperature rises, um, melting of glaciers, and sea level rise, may mean that people are ultimately forced to move away from their homes. It's not necessarily the temperature increase itself that poses the largest challenge in terms of human mobility, but the associated changes in and the combined effects of precipitation patterns such as uh, which will affect flooding and droughts, storms, sea level rise, loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services, as well as health risks, food and livelihood insecurity. In this lecture what I'd like to do is to unpack the notion of a climate change refugee by asking first of all does climate change cause movement and if so how many people are likely to move and in what manner? Secondly, can there be climate change refugees even if you don't believe in anthropogenic climate change? That's the causation bit. Thirdly, how appropriate is that label in light of the, the legal uh, obstacle I mentioned in the first place, the refugee bit? And finally, if we accept there is such a phenomenon, whatever we want to call it, what do we do about it? So to the first part of the, um, the problem, does climate change cause movement? It's actually almost impossible to say that climate change on its own will ever force anybody to move from their home. However, climate change acts as what we call a threat multiplier. In other words, it impacts on pre-existing vulnerabilities or stresses that people or are already experiencing. As one government official in the small island of Kiribati explained to me, climate change overlays pre-existing pressures. Here we're already experiencing overcrowding, unemployment, lack of educational opportunities, poor health services, environmental and development concerns. And what climate change might do to all of this is to provide a tipping point that otherwise might not have been reached. What this means is that the nature of people's, people's movement will vary greatly depending on a range of variables that will interact in different ways at different points in time. Individuals and households tolerance threshold will also vary so what provides the tipping point for one community or for one individual might be different for somebody else. 
In particular, the poorest people or the most vulnerable people in any set of circumstances might not have any choice but to stay put because they may not have the economic means or the social networks, which are very, very important when people make migration decisions, um, or perhaps the skills to, to be able to move. So while those who do move are, are, are considered to be vulnerable, those who stay may actually have even more <coughs> uh, dire uh, situations facing them. One government official in Bangladesh explained that his country suffers from poor development practices. He said when you combine these with over farming of land, overcrowding, deforestation and settlements that are in really environmentally vulnerable and disaster susceptible areas, what happens then is that many people find themselves in conditions where they are inherently more vulnerable to disasters and slow onset processes linked to a changing climate than they would be if these underlying problems were addressed. Complex causality arguments are also supported by the climate science. So it's, it's a, a nonsensical question really to ask, has climate change caused a particular event to happen? It's a fundamentally unanswerable question because no short term event can be conclusively attributed to climate change. Rather, climate represents the average of many weather events over a span of years and varying averages over, over time define climate change. Statistical trends point to an increased frequency and or severity of extreme weather events, which is consistent with global warming. So while individual events can't be predicted, the likelihood of their occurrence can. Accordingly, a probability uh, a prob probability-based risk assessment or risk management framework is the most appropriate one for analysing the link between climate change and extreme weather events. And this enables policymakers to better understand how risk is changing so that prevention and adaptation strategies can be prioritised. Policy interventions, and I include in that legal interventions, and the timing of them will play a major role in shaping outcomes and will determine whether migration is in itself a form of adaptation that allows people to move away from potential harm before they actually have to face it, or whether movement becomes a sign of failure to adapt. For example, the extent to which relief and rehabilitation is available to those displaced by a sudden onset disaster will affect whether and how quickly they can return home and rebuild. So we can con conclude that it's conceptually problematic and empirically flawed to suggest that climate change on its own causes migration. It's best described as an accelerant or a threat multiplier which exacerbates existing socioeconomic or environmental <coughs> vulnerabilities. It certainly plays a role but it's not the only thing at play. Well, the next question, how many people might move, is a highly controversial and debated one. First of all, because there's no agreed definition of who a climate migrant is or a, a forced uh, climate displacee, there are lots of different terms used, because we don't actually have A, an agreed terminology, but B, an agreed or shared understanding, there are conceptual and methodological problems about who actually gets counted. The diff different methods that have been applied by researchers in this area have led to very different conclusions about the magnitude of the problem. The most commonly cited figures come from the work of a social scientist called Norman Myers. In 1993, Myers wrote a paper that suggested that 150 million people could be displaced by climate change by the middle of this century. His methodology was fairly crude. He identified parts of the world thought to be vulnerable to sea level rise, as well as an increase in extreme weather events, and he calculated the number of people likely to be affected by them 
based on anticipated population growth in those regions over the coming decades. In 2005, he revised his estimate, suggesting that it could be up to 200 million people. And four years ago, in an interview with Christian Aid, he said, actually, I think the figure is closer to 250 million. In its own reporting and media briefings, Christian Aid actually inflated that figure uh, and misleadingly implied that one billion people could be displaced by climate change by 2050. What they did, though, was included within that figure other forms of displacement, um, such as normal refugee flows, stateless people, internal displacement. And again, these figures were based on fairly crude methodologies. Problematically, figures like these continue to be cited in media and policy circles, despite their lack of empirical justification. Trumpeting such figures in the absence of defensible methodologies can have a disastrous effect. When the empirical evidence doesn't support numbers like that, the very, and this is ironic, the very motivation behind them, engendering action, can be undercut because people think there's no clear evidence to support the phenomenon at all. This was seen last year when new scientists reported that the small islands in the Pacific, Kiribati and Tuvalu, were growing, not disappearing. Some media commentators suggested that this undermined Pacific, Pacific Island claims for assistance with um, climate change adaptation and also with relocation or migration options. Similarly, <coughs> the Carteret Islands in Papua New Guinea have argued for a number of years now that they are at risk of disappearing as a result of rising sea levels caused by climate change. Whereas other scientific theories suggest that the islands are actually subsiding on account of natural processes. Finally, earlier this year, the UN was lambasted in the media for comments it had supported in 2005 that there would be 50 million climate refugees by 2010. Climate skeptic blogs went crazy, uh, citing this as evidence that climate change wasn't real and that the UN couldn't be trusted. These three examples highlight the dangers of portraying climate change as the sole driver of displacement. The first example, that of Tuvalu and Kiribati, with the islands perhaps growing rather than disappearing, that overlooks the fact that underlying socioeconomic conditions mean that some migration from Pacific atolls such as these is inevitable anyway, as it has been historically. So whether or not the islands are growing or, or disappearing will have little impact on the need for migration options. Similarly, the criticism of the UN in the third example highlights the danger of adopting figures derived from problematic methodologies especially when there is no reliable mechanism to count those who move for climate-related reasons. For example, legislation doesn't uh, contain categories for visas on account of climate-related movement. International law doesn't have a framework. So we don't actually even have a mechanism for reliably determining what those figures uh, might even look like. Acknowledging the multi-causal nature of movement means that studies like these don't discredit discussions about projected movements and don't set back research and policy development on the issue. Furthermore, they demonstrate to climate skeptics that irrespective of the existence or otherwise of anthropogenic climate change, demographic, environmental, development and related pressures mean that certain parts of the world may be unable to sustain their current population levels, and migration may be one way of relieving those pressures. This goes back to the earlier remarks of the government official from Kiribati, which I mentioned. In the past few years, there have been a number of focused case studies that are, are grounded in um, very clear method methodological um, uh, frameworks which provide far more nuanced and evidence-based approaches to the likely nature of climate-related movement. First, 
they show that in most cases, movement is likely to be predominantly internal, that is not across an international border, which is important given some of the security discourse that has accompanied those um, ideas of mass international migration. And it's also, what these studies also show is that movement is on the whole, or the, the bulk of the movement is likely to happen gradually, not as a result of sudden disasters. Of course, there will be some cross-border movement, but not in the magnitude often predicted, and not necessarily in the nature of refugee <coughs> flight. Secondly, climate change is having real impacts on people's lives, but as I've already illustrated, in most cases it's only a number, uh, one of a number of reasons why people might decide to move. Thirdly, the complexity of migration decisions and the interconnectedness of environmental, economic, social and political factors make it virtually impossible to provide an accurate estimate of people who move on account of climate change. Fourthly, existing legal regimes do not provide adequate protection or migration pathways where people do cross an international border. <coughs> the fifth things, thing that these studies reveal is that climate-related movement can manifest in a number of very different ways. What this means is that a one-size-fits-all policy response is not going to be appropriate. And finally, it's essential that international, regional and national responses are informed by a bottom-up approach, taking account of the desires of affected communities and responding appropriately to different situations. Moving to the question whether the groups I'm describing could possibly be understood to be refugees in the sense of international law. Well, the term refugee is a legal term of art. The definition is contained in the 1951 Convention, which actually celebrated its 60th birthday yesterday. And a refugee is defined there as somebody who is outside their country of origin and who has a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership of a particular social group and who isn't able to return to their country because they won't be protected there by the government. Well, the first thing that is striking, given that uh, what the empirical studies reveal is that most movement will be internal, is that the refugee definition only applies if somebody has crossed an international border. Secondly, though, there are difficulties in trying to characterise climate change as persecution. Persecution is understood as entailing violations of human rights that are sufficiently serious, either because of their inherent nature or because of their repetition and cumulative effect, um, which, which mean that it is unsafe for a person to return to their country of origin. It remains very much a question of degree and proportion. Whether something amounts to persecution is assessed according to the nature of the right at risk, the nature and severity of the restriction, and the likelihood of the restriction eventuating in the individual case. The assessment is by nature forward-looking. We're, we're looking into what might happen in the future on the basis of whether or not the individual has a well-founded fear, which is based <laughs> on objective as well as subjective factors. In that regard, that would be entirely appropriate if we are considering whether or not somebody has a potential uh, risk of harm in the future in relation to the potential risk of climate change impacts. But trying to show that climate change constitutes persecution would be nigh on impossible given the, the current jurisprudential understanding of that term. Although adverse climate impacts such as rising sea levels lack of fresh water, salination, increased extreme weather events, 
even though all those things might be harmful, they won't meet that threshold of persecution as it's currently understood. Part of the problem is actually in identifying the persecutor. Now even if you accept that climate change uh, is a result of human activities and, and the result of policies that governments have put in place, or, or rather perhaps the lack of policies governments have put in place to address carbon emissions. That is not, the, the irony here is that people would actually be seeking by and large to move to the places, to the countries which are the persecutor in this case, which is a complete reversal of the refugee paradigm. This is yet another problem in terms of the legal definition or, or people trying to meet the legal definition of refugee, which again is, again, if we look at who the persecutor is, citizens of countries like Tuvalu and Kiribati say, well, we actually love our country, we love our governments and we don't want to leave. So the, their own government remains willing at least to protect them uh, and yet they are trying to leave, you, the, the argument would be they need to leave because they're not safe. Finally, even if we can get over this threshold of, of establishing persecution, the Refugee Convention says that it's not just any old persecution that counts. You have to show you're being persecuted on account of your race or your religion, your political opinion, um, and so on. The difficulty here is that the impacts of climate change are largely indiscriminate rather than tied to particular <coughs> characteristics of, of, a, of an individual's belief system, for example, or background. Now, although climate change will adversely affect some countries um, more than others by virtue of their geography and their resources, the reason it, this is going to happen is, is not because of the, the nationality or the, the race of, of those countries' inhabitants. Some people have said, well, couldn't you argue that, um, that such groups might meet the particular social group category that I mentioned before? So if you're persecuted because of your, you, you belong to a particular social group, um, that might be enough. But the difficulty here is that international refugee law says you can't create a particular social group simply because the common feature is we're all being persecuted, so, because the, the reasoning would be, would be circular. Um, and so, again, that would be a, a fundamental difficulty here. Furthermore, superior courts around the world have explained time and time again that the Refugee Convention does not cover individuals in search of better living conditions or victims of natural disasters, even when the home state is unable to provide assistance. And the, the courts have said that was not the intention of the Refugee Convention and it doesn't extend that far. The High Court of Australia has said that the requirement of persecution limits the Convention's humanitarian scope and does not afford universal protection. And I quote, no matter how devastating may be, epi sorry, may be epidemic, natural disaster or famine, a person fleeing them is not a refugee. People fl fleeing natural disasters and bad economic conditions fall outside the Convention. So far, however, there have been a number of test cases run by people from Kiribati and Tuvalu, from Tonga and Bangladesh in the, in the um, merits review that's the, the um, not, not within, it's never got to the courts, but certainly within the refugee review tribunal level and the equivalent in Australia and New Zealand. All those claims though have failed and the decision makers have said that these people are unfortunate victims of the forces of nature and are not differentially at risk. Nonetheless, there remain limited exceptions where exposure to climate impacts or environmental degradation might amount to persecution for a convention reason. One example would be where government policies target particular groups reliant on agriculture for survival, where climate change is already hampering their existence, uh, subsistence. Or another example would be if a government induced a famine by destroying crops or poisoning water um, or contributed to the destruction of the environment by polluting the land or the water. But in most cases that's not the situation that we're talking about. 
international human rights law may offer some additional protection because the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights says that people cannot be subjected to inhuman or degrading treatment nor to the arbitrary deprivation of life. Even, the existing, even if we look at the existing jurisprudence, we're going to need quite some stretch for the cases that I've been talking about to be considered to reach that threshold. And that, that might seem somewhat counterintuitive because I think one could say, well, clearly um, there will be circumstances in which it would seem to be degrading to live in conditions where um, you, you are finding it very difficult to access fresh water supplies, you can't grow crops anymore, um, that in turn is subjecting your, you to serious health risks and so on. The sticking point here seems to be the degree of imminence of harm. And so if we analyse all those cases around the human rights basis for protection, they are going to turn on how imminent is that threat of harm and will it still face you if you're returned home. So in the case of a sudden disaster, sometimes, well generally people move quite short distances, rarely do they cross an international border. But even if they did, by the time their case were considered, it might be thought to be sufficiently safe for them to return. In the case of slow onset climate change, where we're looking at environments that may be uninhabitable in 20 years time, 50 years time, there I think the decision makers would say, well, unfortunately, that's not soon enough. So the irony would be that you have to wait until it's virtually uninhabitable before you would be successful in being protected through one of those um, human rights based international protection mechanisms. This now brings me to migration as an alternative. Managed international migration may provide a safer and more secure mechanism for enabling people to move away from the longer term effects of climate change without having to artificially um, present as people in need of international protection that is from a persecutory state. Managed migration pathways are better suited to respond to slow onset climate impacts, which are unlikely to trigger um, existing or potentially future temporary protection mechanisms which are designed for sudden disasters. So the United States, for example, has uh, something called temporary protected status, which is designed for people who are already in the US when a natural disaster hits their home country. Uh, and the most recent example is Haiti. So for Haitians who were in the US at the time, they are protected from being removed um, back to Haiti once their visa expires. But that is premised on it being temporary only. So there have actually been cases where temporary protected status was removed because it looked like it would never be safe for people to go home. And the US government said, well, therefore, it's not temporary protection, it's potentially permanent, so we have to withdraw that status from them. There was a lot of lobbying in that particular case to enable people from Montserrat to, to be able to remain permanently in the US, but it's going to have to happen on a, a very ad hoc um, basis, if, and it will rely absolutely on government discretion. So if we think about managed migration, where we create uh, visa categories for which people can apply, in advance. This is something that the president of Kiribati has been very, very vocal in promoting. He talks about merits-based migration or migration with dignity. And he says that he's keen to skill up the population of Kiribati so that Kiribati citizens can be a useful labour force abroad and can contribute meaningfully at home in the meantime if they can't migrate. He sees this as a win-win situation. Overseas employment provides a way of improving the economic condition and sometimes also the social status of the family. And it also provides a, a livelihood diversification and risk management strategy. Additionally, since Kiribati can't sustain a population of its current size, it's around 100,000 people, um, but some parts of Kiribati um, are, have the population, a, a population density greater than Hong Kong, but no high rise. So people are living in quite squalid conditions in some parts of the country. 
Um, and, and in any event, irrespective of climate change, population pressure would, would be an issue. And so Kiribati, in any event, would be pursuing greater out-migration options. What this could also mean, and this is important because most people say, I can't bear to think of my country possibly not existing in the future. What people also say is, well, look, a lot of our young people want to migrate. They're happy to do that. If we relieve population pressure on our island, more of us can remain here for longer than if everybody were forced to stay here now. Furthermore, remittances from migrants could contribute to further adaptation funding in Kiribati. So migration would address the two most desired outcomes expressed by the people I interviewed. On the one hand, the desire to remain at home for as long as possible, which is a view particularly common among the older people. And on the other hand, the expansion of migration opportunities to enable predominantly younger people to move to other countries, earn a living, send remittances back home, and be seen as valued contributors to their new country, rather than as charity cases. And that's, um, that can't be um, neglected either, because when I ask people, do you think of yourself, or would you like to be described as a, a climate refugee, the answer was overwhelmingly no. People said, we see, we see refugees as people who lack any dignity, who are stuck in camps with no solutions, who are reliant on handouts by the international community, and we as proud Pacific Islanders do not want to be associated with that concept. As a migration scholar, a forced migration scholar, that view is somewhat troubling because um, we always try and talk about the, the resilience of refugees, but I think what it does show is um, the failure of the international protection regime and of the political will to, to solve um, the, the problems that we see in forced migration generally. With respect to migration from the Pacific, the other thing it can do is um, respond to labour shortages in countries like Australia and New Zealand, which are pinpointed as the, the places to which people want to go, particularly with an ageing population. These are labour shortages that we are going to have. Of course, I'm not naive to the problems that international migration can bring. And, um, and of course, the people of Kiribati and Tuvalu talk about some of those negative impacts as well. Um, in other parts of the world, migration is seen less as a permanent kind of thing and, and much more as a temporary move. And we know of um, terrible stories of exploitation of migrant workers in some countries, which obviously we would be um, in any sort of solution would need to try and um, avoid. One other thing though is that long before climate change became an issue of concern, the governments of Kiribati and Tuvalu were actively lobbying Australia and New Zealand and other countries in the region for migration opportunities. Demographic pressures on these already environmentally fragile atolls which had experienced rapid urbanisation and internal migration within a 20-year period, meant that permanent migration ab abroad was a, a live public policy issue. And what I find fascinating is that as early as 1984, AusAid, Australia's foreign aid agency, said that enhancing migration opportunities would be the most useful form of aid. New Zealand has actually um, taken a step further and links its aid policy and, and development um, to its migration program. So New Zealand actually has a category known as the Pacific Access Category, which provides um, a number of visas to people from Tuvalu and Kiribati, among a couple of other Pacific countries, um, whereby they can apply for permanent residence in New Zealand. They have to be between 18 and 45 years of age, have a job offer in New Zealand, which can be a tricky thing, but um, there have been employers that have come across to the islands and offered everybody there a job if they want it. Um, there, there's, uh, you, you need to have a certain level of English and a certain income, and you can bring your close family members with you. But this operates a bit like a, a lottery, and so everybody who wants to put their name forward does, 
then the names get drawn out of the hat and only at that point is eligibility assessed. But everybody in uh, Kiribati and Tuvalu uh, with whom I spoke knew of that scheme and embraced it as something very positive on the whole. So what then should be done about this issue of climate change related movement? In my view, legal and policy responses must involve a combination of strategies rather than an either or approach. For example, migration options should be explored for preemptive movement, but this shouldn't rule out a parallel humanitarian response for rapid onset disasters or for people who are facing the effects of slow onset change but who are unable or unwilling to migrate up front. So as a, as a residual option to um, perhaps widen the net of, of, who, uh, fam of what family is considered as in terms of um, bringing family members on visas um, or simply for people to know that um, they will be allowed to live elsewhere should the time um, come for that. A range of options needs to be utilised um, that are country and region specific and therefore attuned to the particular needs of those countries and regions. International protection frameworks, underscored by human rights law, provide important benchmarks for assessing needs and responses. They offer an existing body of rules and principles that can guide and inform policy making, and they also have uh, identifiable rights bearers and duty bearers. Even though the scope for activating human rights law more broadly might be limited in the climate change displacement context, at least at this point in time. The normative principles of human rights law provide a universal framework that can help us shape policy. Um, and in particular, I think a human rights based analysis helps to highlight issues that would be obscured by a purely environmental or scientific or economic analysis of climate change. And furthermore, human rights law puts squarely in the focus um, individual and group claims about access, about adaptation, participation and balance. In addition to ensuring that specific human rights are safeguarded, it's important that all responses to climate change related movement, however conceived, are steeped in broader humanitarian norms such as the fundamental principles of humanity, human dignity and international cooperation. These provide an overarching normative framework to guide the way in which solutions are crafted and implemented. So do climate change refugees exist? Well, in a general descriptive sense, yes they do. But how we ought to respond to the very diverse forms which that movement might take. And the fact that most people will want to remain in their homes for as long as possible means that strategies and solutions will need to be creative, flexible and holistic. Arguably, an approach which views climate change as one of a, multi a multitude of possible drivers of movement and which advocates for solutions to those wider problems opens up more opportunities for solutions and institutional mm. capacity. Thank you very much.